A long line at airport security. Slow service at a favorite restaurant. Election results to come in. We don't like to wait. As a species, we human beings tend to be pretty darn impatient. Just ask the buyers you're working with right now. I bet you have some buyers, or had some recently, who were tired of waiting for the right home to come on the market. Heck, it's not just the clients, is it? I know some agents right now who themselves are tired of waiting for more homes to hit the market and tired of showing the same clients around for weeks or months because they can't find the one. You guys, stop waiting. If you want to stand out from the crowd, if you want to separate yourself from what other agents in your market are doing, it's time to stop reacting and start acting. It's time to go out and find inventory instead of waiting for it to reach the market. Our guest today has been doing that for years and now runs one of the top teams in the country, and he's going to share with you how they do it. This is The Walkthrough. Hi, everybody. I'm Matt McGee, editor of Homelight's Agent Resource Center. Welcome to The Walkthrough. On this show, you'll learn what's working right now from the best real estate agents and industry experts in the country. At Homelight, we believe in real estate agents, and we're on a journey to find out how great agents grow their business, stand out from the crowd, and become irreplaceable. You can get in touch with me in a few different ways. Leave a voicemail or send a text to 415-322-3328. You can email walkthrough at homelight.com or find me in our Facebook listener community. Just go to Facebook, search Homelight Walkthrough. The group will come right up and you'll find me and many, many other listeners in there. How's inventory in your market right now? Still really low? I bet it is. I'll cite this statistic again from Homelight's latest Top Agent Insights Survey. 76% of you across the country said you've never seen inventory as low as it's been the past couple months. So what do you do with the buyers that you're trying to help right now? It's one thing to wait in the airport security line or wait for your steak dinner to arrive. But if you're sitting around waiting for more inventory to hit the market, well, that's impacting your buyer's plans. It's impacting their lives and it's impacting your bottom line. My guest today says it's time to stop waiting. Anthony Margulis has a handful of ideas to help you and your buyers go out and find homes for sale rather than waiting for them to hit the MLS. He's the owner of Amalfi Estates. It's an independent brokerage in Pacific Palisades, which is just a beautiful community northwest of Los Angeles. Anthony has sold almost $2 billion in properties in his career, and he's a fixture on the Real Trends rankings of top agents. This year, his team was number 24 in sales volume among medium-sized teams. One more thing, he's also been a guest lecturer about real estate at UCLA since 2004. As you'll hear during our conversation, one of the keys to Anthony's success has been his ability to find inventory when none seems to exist. He has creative ideas for finding and tracking off-market listings and helping get those listings in front of his buyers. So that's our theme today. Be proactive, don't wait, go out and find inventory. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Anthony Margulis. The biggest problem you're in sales and you don't have a product to sell, what are you going to do? So, you know, the average agent is waiting. They go to the MLS and they wait. And they almost like waiting for the phone to ring after you've had a hot date, right? You wait for the phone to ring. So instead of having that uh, mentality, we recommend having being proactive. So really having a, a, a proactivity mindset to finding properties. So instead of just waiting and being reactive, we want you to be proactive. And, and the proactive mindset is really kind of like you're a matchmaker now. So instead of matchmaking, you know, two people, you're now matchmaking, how can I find that property that is not on the market 
and make it competitive and make it fun, right? Make it like a challenge and a fun challenge. So whether you're on a team or whether you're by yourself or whoever, you say, look, you know, my client's looking for a three-bedroom house for $500,000 in this certain neighborhood. What can I do to be creative, think outside the box, to locate that property for them? And I'm going to give you six or seven different tools to your listeners how they can do that. And it's not easy. It's not like a magic wand. It takes work. So if you want to put the work in, you're going to have a huge return on your investment. Yeah. So, so the first thing is just recognizing that, that this market is unlike any other, and you can't just sit back and wait for the listings to come to you. You need to take action. You need to say, Hey, I've got these buyers. They are looking for X, Y, and Z. I need to go out and actually find X, Y, and Z for them rather than just waiting for things to come to me. That's exactly right. And, and, and my hope is there's going to be several suggestions I'm going to give that should trigger maybe new ideas, um, things maybe you've done in the past, but you haven't done now because you haven't needed to, and uh, or just new ideas. Like, hey, I hadn't thought about doing that. Um, and the nice thing about some of these ideas is not only will it generate inventory that you didn't have, it'll generate potential listings that you may not have had either because you're thinking outside the box and you're basically going after and, and, and being um, proactive. Uh, to find stuff that's not available. All right, so why don't we dive in? What are some of, you mentioned six or seven different things that agents can do to be proactive and go out and find this inventory. How does that begin? Where do you start? So a couple of things here. So I'm gonna start with um, developing an off-market database. So now we wanna be really clear. National Associate of Realtors has put together a clear cooperation policy. So in no way do we wanna violate that policy. So it's very, very important that you're you're clear and you understand what the repercussions are, that you cannot publicly advertise a listing outside of your own office and talk to your broker, right? You want to talk to your broker and manager about this and get their expertise. You know, you have 24 hours. If you publicly market an off-market property, you're supposed to put it in your MLS within 24 hours. So really putting together a pocket listing database. And um, it's a lot of work though. I want to be really clear. So in our marketplace, there's approximately 115 homes on the market in Pacific Palisades where we cover. We have off market approximately 100 properties off market in addition to what's in the multiple listing service. So that's really, really powerful information. It's taken us about 20 years to put together because we're constantly adding to it. We're constantly to update it because it's a, it's a lot of work. But once you have a pocket listing database, off market, and it, a lot of people have pieces of paper and they stick it in a drawer. I'm talking about actually a database. It can be a Google database. It can be your CRM. You know, however you want to put it together, but it's got to be something you can sort and you can manage. And we sort it by price and we sort it by area. So because of of things like this off market database, we have been very successful. Um, I personally sold 17 properties off market in one year alone. Um, so it's been tremendous for our business in having the mindset, the productivity mindset of finding properties that are not currently in the multiple listing service. So first one, pocket listing or coming soon database. Yeah, let me, and let me just dive a little bit further into the database. I mean, you you mentioned that that you guys are focused on you want to at least be able to sort on what'd you say location and price. What all information are you keeping about in, in this database? So we have bedrooms, bathrooms, square footage, lot size, cost per square foot, the date we inputted it. We have a note section, which gives us additional information. We have the contact for that property and the phone number. About In our database, about a third are my personal pocket listings. The rest are either agents on my team, agents I've networked with, uh, things of that nature. The average agent has two or three off-market properties they know about. We currently have 600. You can imagine the value that that brings. You know, when the average agent has one or two and we have 600, and and I want to be really clear, some of these off-market properties are like, like people assume an off-market, oh, I'm ready to go. They're ready to sell. No, no. What, what the, the reason people want to be off market, either it's a celebrity client, maybe it's someone who's really private, 
and they don't want their neighbors to know, and they don't want their kids to know yet, and they don't want maybe open houses, and they're really, really private. And so they're like, look, we're really private, and so we want to kind of sell this privately off market. That, that's one example. The other example is someone, a seller will say, hey, you sold me a property for $500,000, let's say, three years ago. If you can get me $600,000 today, yeah, I may be open to selling. And that's really more what it is. It's a conversation piece. So then we go to our, our clients and we say, hey, look, this person says I may be interested in selling. Um, you know, let's take a look at it. And it starts developing the conversation of, of, of moving things along. So these aren't, you know, you, you have to be really patient, you know, working with off markets. You have to be really um, uh, manage a client's expectations. The client says, hey, I want to see five year off markets tomorrow. I'm like, that doesn't work that way. Like, give me a few weeks and I will slowly <laughs> get you into these properties, especially during COVID. How do you talk to your, well, both the buyer and the potential seller about the pros and cons of staying off market when the market is the way it is now. And in some cases, it might be more beneficial for the homeowner to go on market. Yeah, we obviously explain, you know, in an ideal world, it's, it's, we believe it's more beneficial to come on market because they're going to expose it to a larger clientele. That was the whole reason NAR started their clear cooperation policy. Because unfortunately, with a lot of pockets, agents tend to represent dual agency, which in, in the states that it's legally allowed is kind of not ethically, doesn't always work in the buyer and the seller's best benefit. Because one after it closes, one person and the other is going to say, oh my God, I left money on the table or I paid too much. Right. So because I didn't expose it to the marketplace. So in an ideal world, we want to tell our off-market clients, yeah, it's in your best interest to come on the market. And hopefully they'll listen to us. If they don't listen to us and against our, our best recommendations, they decide to sell it off market because of the privacy concerns I mentioned before. Um, that's their prerogative, you know, but we definitely encourage them to, to actually list it in, in the MLS. When you think about finding homes for sale that are off market, the most obvious source might be for sale by owners. And there are lots of ways you can find FISBOs, Craigslist, classified ads in your local paper, FISBO focused websites. Uh, Zillow even has a section of its website where FISBOs are listed. If you want to spend some money looking for inventory this way, you can also try software like Remine, Prospect Now, and other market intelligence services. A lot of MLSs actually uh, have Remine built in, so it may not cost you anything. You can use it to identify homeowners who might be ready to sell soon. And speaking of the MLS, that is the next tip Anthony has for finding new inventory. So pocket listing database is one. Another one is, is mining the MLS. And when I say by mining the MLS, you know, go after the expireds, withdrawns, canceled, and even the solds. And what we do is this is the this is the the, the trick, if you will. Most agents do that and they go after the seller because they want to pick up a listing. What we found is you actually go after the previous listing agent and you join forces with them and you partner with them. They are so much more inclined. They lost the listing, right? Or they canceled the listing and or withdrew it from the MLS. And you say, hey, I may have a buyer for this property. Can you please let me know if your seller may still be interested in selling? And you're going to get a lot of inside information you would never have had before, as opposed to just cold calling a seller with a hundred other agents or cold calling them. You're actually getting to that former agent. I will pay you a referral fee, right? I will bet you'll financially get compensated. And it's, it's worked wonders. And I'd rather have a little bit of something than a lot of nothing. And I think it's good karma to spread you know, the, the, the good cheer around, if you will. Right. And so uh, we've been very, very um, uh, successful uh, using that, that strategy. I'll give you one example. One of our agents, uh, Victoria in our office, uh, she did that with a, a, a very high-end condo building in our market. And she was able to sell a $2 million property a few months ago because she contacted an agent in that building who previously had a listing in there. 
and she would never have sold it if she had not done that because they tricked that other agent gave confidential information that was able to benefit her client in order to make the deal. So reach out instead of going directly to the homeowner the, or the seller, get that agent involved and see if you can revive that listing, get it back and make it, make, make it available to your, to your buyer. That's exactly right. Or they may say, you know what? It's amazing you called Anthony because I was thinking about, I'm planning on coming on the market in January. So it's so fortuitous that you called. So you just got a head start. Maybe you can offer that type that property before it comes officially on the market. So there's there's no downside. You already know they were interested in selling at one time or another. So there's a higher likelihood they're still going to be interested in still wanting to sell. When you call the the listing agent that lost the listing, whether it was expired, canceled, whatever it might have happened, do you change your script, your questions depending upon what happened with the listing? Not necessarily. I mean, it was taken off the market. We don't know why. So we don't. We aren't privy yet to the information. Was, was it a divorce sale? Was it, um, you know, what was the reason behind it? It, it? Were they doing an 1031 exchange and they couldn't find their replacement property? Was it a probate sale where someone passed away? Um, you know, what was the reason why you were selling? And so we're never going to find that out really until we talk to the other agent and then they share that information with us. And then we can act accord- We can act accordingly. If they say, you know, it's a divorce sale, they're not planning on selling. Or if they say, you know, they need to wait a year for capital gains laws, you know, depending on what they say, we'll, we'll react accordingly. Hi, everyone. If you're enjoying the walkthrough, we'd appreciate it if you tell the real estate agents in your network about us. Even more, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Your feedback helps us get better, and in some cases can also help new listeners find and hear us. And when we get around to having you on the show, the more listeners, the better, right? What else can agents be doing? So, so we've covered a couple. We've talked about um, the the pocket listing database, mining the MLS. What other? Okay, so the next one is is mailing to a specific farm or area. And oh, I know a lot of people do that, but I'll, I'll tell you our little twist on it. So this is like our secret sauce. So everyone gets letters from an agent saying, "Oh, you know, I have a buyer, and they want to move to their neighborhood." And what I found is it needs to be personalized. And it needs to be handwritten. Okay. So the more personal information you can put in that letter and, you know, ideally, you know, don't farm a thousand people in a neighborhood because then all the neighbors are going to be like, yeah, did you get the letter from Bob? Yeah, I got Bob's letter. Did you get Bob's letter? So what you do is you handpick the specific properties that meet your client's criteria. If your client's only looking for not more than a 3,000 square foot home, not more than a 10,000 square foot lot, not more than four bedrooms that, you know, maybe it's been built in the last 10 years, then just easy, go to the title company and you just farm, you just pick the specific criteria that matches your client's needs. So then what you do is you put as much specific information as possible in that letter. For example, you're representing an, a, a doctor and they're an oncology surgeon and they have three young kids and they want to get in before the school year starts and they have two dogs and whatever, you know, they whatever information that your client has given you authorization to give, even if they can give a first name, you know, Bob and, and Betty, you know, uh, and, and the more information you can give, the more it personalizes it and it shows them the credibility because most sellers are so hardened by, they're just giving me a letter because they want it. They say they have a buyer and they really don't and they want to get the list. So the more you can personalize it, that is the key. It humanizes it. And you'll get a much higher response rate by doing it by doing it that way. Okay, okay, so hand so handwritten instead of a postcard. Yeah, and you can buy the fonts. There's font, you know. There's a lot of uh, software out there. It looks like it's handwritten. Okay, so and so you're not instead of you know blanketing five hundred or a thousand postcards, you're you're taking the time to be more targeted in, about it. You're doing something that's more personal and handwritten. So mailers to specific farm or area. Correct. What else are, what else are, are you guys doing? So the other one is, is, is past clients and your sphere of influence. So this is really a, a gold mine, especially for agents that have, been, that have been in business for a little while. So it's a fantastic excuse 
call someone who maybe you sold a home to a few years ago. And you're like, hey, I'm just checking in. How are you doing? You know, I know we haven't talked in a while. And what you say is this. Say, I know you're not interested in selling, but do you know anyone that may be interested in, in, in selling? I have a client who is fantastic. They're a doctor. They have a very good income. They have perfect credit. They're all cash or they're putting a large down payment. And they're really motivated. They've seen everything on the market. So I know you know a lot of people. Bob, so Bob, if you ever come in contact with someone that, that may be thinking about selling, please let me know. I would really, really appreciate that. And then usually it'll get into, well, you know, I'm kind of thinking about it for myself. Oh, you know what? I wasn't even thinking about it for you. I was thinking about it <laughs> if you knew anyone. <laughs> so it's a very soft, indirect way to ask. And it's a great excuse to call your client. Um, and and I also, I would recommend your sphere of influence. So far, Anthony has shared with us four ways that you can find inventory in a market like we have now, where inventory is at a premium. He's talked about creating a database of off-market properties, mining the MLS for canceled, expired, and the like, doing mailers, not to the area where your buyers are looking, but to specific homes that match what they're looking for, and reaching out to your past clients and sphere to let them know about your current buyer's needs. Next up is a similar idea to that last one, but rather than talking to people you know, this one involves advertising your buyer's needs far and wide. So normally when you have a listing, you advertise your listing on print and in online. So social media and in print publications. So you do the same thing with your buyer's needs. So for example, if you say, I have a buyer and they're looking for this specific neighborhood of this town and they are looking for a certain size home and a certain style of home, you advertise that in the print publication. So your local papers and you advertise it on in Facebook and on Instagram and on LinkedIn. And you say, look, here's a list of my 10 buyers And here's what they're looking for. And what it does is two things. That you're networking with your sphere of influence. Remember, you're being the matchmaker thing. It's like you're putting this net out there and saying, hey, anyone know anyone? I got this great guy or great girl and I want to set people up. You know, and that's what you're doing. You're being proactive and you're advertising your buyer's needs. Now, two things are going to happen there. One, other people are going to be like, wow, that's really creative. Why didn't my agent think that? Two, (laughs) someone's going to be like, you know, I was thinking about selling. Let me call this guy and, and see what's happening. And you may get a listing out of it. Okay. We've gotten listing from it. It's been, it's been really, really great. And, and the other key is some mistakes I see ag- the agents that, that have tried this technique is the criteria that they advertise is too similar. So it's really important. Like, don't put, I have one buyer looking for 400,000 to 450. I have another looking from 400 to 500. I have another looking, you know, they overlap. So it's better just to be a little bit broader, right? Because you're going to pick a wider net, okay? So if someone's looking in the south part of town then, then and, and they're in one price point, and others looking in the north part of town and another price point, that's okay. But it, but, but it do not get too specific because you want to have a little bit wider net. Because if a, if a client says to you, I, I have to have a Spanish style home, or I have to have a modern home. Well, between you and I, you and I know, if we send them an architectural home, or if we send them a mid-century modern, they can turn it into a modern one, right? right. So, so don't be too specific. Keep it a little broad. And you've done this. You mentioned your local paper. I mean, for you, that's what, the LA Times? Uh, we do the Palisadian Post. Okay. Uh, we have done the LA Times. We do the Palisadian Post. Uh, we do local magazines. Uh, we do social media. And, um, you know, if nothing else, it gives the subtle impression to your clients and your sphere of influence, wow, that's really creative. Yeah. This is someone I want to work with, right? They're doing something different. Right. You're you're going above and beyond what the consumer typically sees real estate agents do. That's exactly right. Yeah. So that that that, that that's been a great one. Okay. So one last question on this. So the ad might say something like, well, and you fill in the blanks for me, Anthony. We have a buyer looking for, I mean, do you list like four bedrooms, three baths? Yeah, what we try and do, it depends what the client's looking for, um, but and it depends how many of that product would be available in that marketplace. Okay. So if you're looking for a white elephant, you do not want to be 
a specific, like I'm, if you're looking in a 3000 square foot home neighborhood and the homes are selling for 500,000 and you go, well, I want a 5,000 square foot home for $200,000. People are going to look at you like, that's a little, (laughs) you know, come on, you know, wait a minute. Yeah. I want that too. Can you give me 10 of those? (laughs) (laughs) Right. Exactly. So, so, um, so it it really, it really depends on that, but but ideally, you know, uh, square, the important things, you know, room for a pool, maybe ocean view property, um, flat usable lot, uh, move in condition, things of that nature that would really uh, elicit um, the things. Now, we don't get the phone ringing off the hook. I want to be really clear. Um, you know, for every three or four ads, we get maybe a couple calls, but that's a couple calls we didn't have before. All of the strategies and ideas that Anthony has shared so far, it's all about finding inventory that isn't already on the market. As our conversation was wrapping up, Anthony said there are some unique benefits to being able to do this. For starters, this is one way to break into higher price points. He says sophisticated buyers will appreciate that you have information and access to properties that other agents don't know about. One good example of all of this is Victoria, the agent in his office that Anthony mentioned earlier. He says her business took off as soon as she got proactive about looking for inventory that wasn't currently on the market. She was having a little bit of a slump. We recommended she focus on the off markets and it created like a superpower for her. And and it gave her the confidence, almost as like a hunter, if you will, like, like I'm gonna go find something that's not there. And she was able to differentiate her skill from all the other agents out there and she's been able to generate incredible referrals and client loyalty because her clients saw how much harder she worked for them. Okay. So um, she's been very, very successful mailing to specific areas um, and doing online social media. Um, and just to give you a, a concrete example, 50% of her business last year was from off market properties. of her business last year was from off-market properties. She did approximately $10 million in home sales from off-market properties. So um, this year, she's on track to triple her business. And the main reason is because she's perfected the skills to find properties that were not currently on the market. So um, I think it's really, really important just to Go the extra mile. But I want to be really clear. This is not for everyone. If you think it's easy and you think it's a magic wand and I just want to make it simple, Matt, it's not. It's it's hours of work, but the payoff will be huge if you want to put the time in. I think one of the things that sort of underlies, Anthony, a lot of the, the ideas that you've shared is the value of networking, communication, Right. Staying in touch with other agents so that you know what's going on in their world, staying in touch with your past clients and your sphere so you can know who might be thinking about selling if the circumstances are right. I It sounds to me like there's a real premium on just really being dialed in with the people in your market. 100%. Knowledge is power. If your marketplace has X number of properties on the market, and I know throughout the country, as you mentioned, it's been it's, it's historically low inventory across the country. So if you can employ one or two or more of these techniques and find properties that were no longer that were not that are not currently on the market, I don't care if it's one new property. That's a huge value add to your clients. I think that's a great point Anthony made right there at the end. If you can help just one buyer get in a home that they love by proactively looking for homes that aren't in the MLS, I mean, what a huge win. And think of the potential referrals that you will get from that. Anthony, thank you so much for being on the walkthrough. Let's do our takeaways segment. Here is what stood out to me from today's conversation. Takeaway number one, we spent a lot of time talking about the value of having an off-market database. Anthony says, He talks to homeowners about the benefits of going to market, but hey, some of them prefer staying private. So his team has been tracking those sellers in a database for years. And he says, be patient because these folks aren't necessarily ready to sell right now. The situation has to be right. 
And of course, do not, under any circumstances, violate the clear cooperation policy. If you publicly advertise a home for sale, it has to go in the MLS within 24 hours. Takeaway number two, mine the MLS. Look for expireds, withdrawns, cancels, and so forth. Anthony's tip here is don't contact the homeowner, contact the listing agent. You'll learn more about what happened and make a good connection. Takeaway number three, do very specific mailers. Handwrite a letter and rather than hit the entire neighborhood, only send it to properties that match your buyer's interests. Takeaway number four, reach out to your past clients and sphere of influence. Do you know anyone who's looking to sell? I have a client who's looking for X, Y, and Z. And then takeaway number five, advertise your buyer's needs. Anthony will place ads in local papers, magazines, social media, and so forth saying, we have buyers looking for homes that fit these descriptions. Contact us if you're thinking about selling. So there you go, five ways to be proactive about finding new inventory. If you have any questions or feedback, you can leave a voicemail or send me a text. It's 415-322-3328. You can send an email to walkthrough at homelight.com or find me in our Facebook listener community. Just do a search for Homelight Walkthrough and the group will come right up. Anthony Margulis is in the community as well. So if you have questions or feedback for him, that's a great place to do it. That's all for this week. Thanks again to Anthony Margulis for joining me and thank you for listening. My name's Matt McGee and you've been listening to The Walkthrough. At Homelight, we believe in real estate agents. We're on a journey to find out how great agents grow their business, stand out from the crowd and become irreplaceable. Go out and sell some homes. Do it safely, everyone. I'll talk to you again next week. Bye-bye.